class, Professor Cook here. This is part two of chapter six, Social Control and Deviance. And today we're going to be talking about the difference between deviance and crime and discussing some statistics about crime in the United States and also some sociological theoretical perspectives on crime. So first of all, just to kind of define what crime is as opposed to deviance. Um, what makes crime different from deviance is that there is some kind of public law um, that is makes the person who commits the crime subject to punishment by an authority. So deviance would be breaking a norm, right? And remember when we talked about norms, we had that Venn diagram of mores, uh, folkways, taboos, and uh, crimes and laws. Um, so laws would be what you would have to break in order to commit a crime. So that's the biggest difference between a crime and an act of deviance, is in a crime you're breaking a written law, some kind of codified uh, norm. Criminologists are researchers who use uh, scientific methods to study crime and try to understand and ultimately control criminal behavior to prevent it. So we'll be talking about that, coming back to that in a few minutes. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about two sources of crime statistics. I don't know, I don't think these are talked about a lot in your text. This chapter is really rich and I'm not going to have time to cover everything in it, but it is very interesting. Um, if you want to get into more detail, um, definitely recommend taking a look at some of the, the concepts in the book, like the panopticon and sort of surveillance and control through that way. Um, but for now, I just want to explain that crime statistics are always some sort of an estimate. So we don't, we don't know, we don't count every single crime, of course, because so much goes unreported. So I just kind of want to give you a sense of how we do these estimates in terms of social science and how the government and local agencies track this. So there's two major sources of statistics for us on crime. Uh, one is official data that comes from something called the Uniform Crime Report, the Uniform Crime Report, and the image here is what those reports historically looked like. They used to be published in paper and now you can find them all um, online through, I think it's a .gov address, which is pretty interesting, and you can, if you like to geek out about statistics, you can kind of play around with searching those databases. Um, not required to, just, just kind of interesting that that's available. So what the UCR, or the Uniform Crime Report, tracks is crimes reported to the police and arrests. Weirdly, though, it does not include federal offenses like kidnapping, internet-based crime, or corporate crime which is a pretty big category of crime. So I'm not really sure. My guess is that's because um, those would be tracked by the FBI and not by your local police uh, departments and counties. And then based on this, um, you know, we know, of course, that a lot of crime is unreported. I mean, if someone steals something where you feel like it's not really worth reporting that because you're not going to get it back, um, you know, that's technically a crime, but we can estimate as social scientists that almost 60% of all crime roughly is unreported. So let me ask you this class uh, virtually. <laughs> um, if this official data does not include mm -hmm. these federal offenses, but only includes cl crimes reported, how can I tell you with any kind of degree of confidence, and I do have confidence, that almost more than half, excuse me, more than half of all crime is not reported. Well, the reason I can do that is because of this other source of information about crime. Victim surveys, the National Crime Victimization Survey. and This is administered by the U.S. Department of Justice, and this is where they randomly contact uh, lots of people in the United States and ask about their experiences. So it's not perfect, but based on this and how people respond to this, they get a sense of how much of that crime, uh, overall number of crime is unreported. So I, I would challenge you to kind of consider which crimes are most likely to go unreported or 
let me phrase that a more clear way, which crimes do you think are least likely to be reported? I'm pretty sure you can you can guess which what some of those would be, and they make up a pretty significant amount of this. So again, two sources of crime statistics, uniform crime report, that's reported crimes, excluding those federal offenses we mentioned, and then crime victimization surveys, and this is a Anonymous survey administered by the U.S. Department of Justice. Really important, though, because, again, it gets at that significant 60% of crime that is not reported. It gives us that, that picture. So one type of the crime, or excuse me, one type of crime that goes unreported is vice or quote-unquote victimless crime. So these are crimes like uh, drug use, prostitution, public drunkenness, uh, illegal gambling. So they're, they're called victimless crimes because technically the person who is participating in the crime is not doing that against their will. And I'm going to put this in big air quotes because I don't think it is entirely accurate to say that prostitution, drug use, and some theft related to those, those um, other types of crime are necessarily without victims. Um, we know that people get into really desperate situations. Uh, there's human trafficking issues involved, um, drug trafficking issues, and, and gang violence that would sort of coerce someone into these types of crimes. And in that case, personally, I would consider the person committing the quote-unquote crime to also be a victim. That's just something to think about, but just so that you are aware Vice or victimless crimes are these categories where the person committing the crime is very unlikely to report it because they are doing the crime, if you will. Um, okay, so if you have questions about that, you can let me know. I want to talk a little bit about the war on drugs here. So this is where we're going to get a little bit technical and a little bit more uh, in depth. And this, if you if you are interested in this. I'm gonna, I can definitely share more resources with you, but I think it's really important as we move into understanding the problem of mass incarceration in the United States. In the United States, we really like to put people in prison. And I say that because the statistics, the statistic, excuse me, cited in your book is something like 6.8 um, million Americans are either in prison on parole or on probation, and that's one in 37. Does that sound right? Hopefully. Uh, hopefully I remembered that correctly. But what I wanted to say is overall, we, we really incarcerate at a much higher rate than other countries around the world. So that kind of goes back to that question we left off with at the end of class or the end of lecture last time, where I said, you know, Durkheim predicted that in this really specialized society, right, we would have we would have rehabilitation, not so much punitive based punishment for crime. We would want people to get back uh, into being productive and participatory members of society. Well, our level of incarceration suggests otherwise, and that we are really focused more on removing those individuals and then um, sort of placing them in a category that is forever uh, stigmatized, right, forever uh, marked so, so that people are not able to come back and participate in society. So in exploring um, why that is occurring, I want to talk about the war on drugs. Okay. So um, the war on drugs was started in the 1970s by President Nixon, but it really gained um, steam, if you will, in the 1980s under the presidency of Ronald Reagan. What I have for you on this slide are some really fancy graphs, um, <laughs> that I mean that sarcastically, that I made that show the funding allocation differences in different departments that would be um, looking to arrest and prosecute people for drug crimes. So you can see that the FBI, the DEA, FBI, right, the, the drug um, 
gosh, I'm blanking on what DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency, okay, stands for, and uh, Department of Defense's anti-drug bu budgets just in, within four to ten years went up astronomically, okay? Police departments had incentives to prosecute even low-level drug arrests for things like possession of marijuana that we now would consider a pretty minimal crime or a misdemeanor, right? And drug use was increasing. But what is interesting, if you look at this history, is that drug use was not increasing at a level to match this change in funding allocation. In other words, you've got a bit of a chicken and the egg um, problem here. What came first, the drug war or the drug use? And the answer is kind of both together. They mutually reinforced one another, and that's another discussion for a different day. Um, but I pulled these from a book called The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, and then she got them from um, government records and websites. Um, so I wanted to just point out what these slides are telling you is that we as a society in the 70s and 80s when we did see an increase in people using illicit drugs, we could have decided to treat that like a public health problem. Okay, so if you think about what's happening now with the opioid crisis, that is treated, I would say, I would make the argument much more like a public health problem where you see people suing um, the pharmaceutical manufacturers, you see people um, trying to get people treatment, right, education, and funding toward that. What you do not see is them trying to lock up every single person who's an opioid addict. This is a stark contrast to what was done in response um, to drug use increases in the 80s. You did see people trying to lock up every single person using crack, heroin, or powder cocaine, or marijuana. Okay, and where these numbers connect in is if we had treated, if we had treated drug use like a public health issue, this budget would have increased rather than decreased. Okay, so the National Institute on Drug Abuse would have been the agency to fund prevention, treatment, addiction, uh, recovery programs, and instead of getting more money, you can see their budget was slashed. So what this is telling you is that we as a society constructed drug use as a crime, okay? I'm not saying it's not a crime. I'm saying we chose a response that was very different to how we've chosen to respond now and how we could have chosen to respond. Okay, so that's going to be significant as we come to this next slide because what this ends up being, class, is an, an egregious example of social injustice and an egregious example of institutional racism or institutional discrimination. We talked about individual versus institutional discrimination in the race chapter and I said individual discrimination has to be one-to-one -one, but institutional is a product of society functioning the way it was designed and you can really see this at, through this example of sentencing mandatory minimums for crack versus powder cocaine during the 1980s and 90s. Okay, so crack and powder, two different kinds of cocaine. Cocaine is an illegal drug. It gained popularity in the 80s, but as I said, the war on drugs was also ramping up at this time, so it's, hard, it's really difficult to say which was the response, um, and there's a lot more to say there, but for now, let's just look at the differences here. So if you were a person who used crack cocaine in the 80s and uh, 90s and you got caught with this amount of cocaine, 5 grams, if it was crack, you got a mandatory minimum sentence of 5 years. First time offense. That's a harsh sentence as a mandatory minimum. The judge has to give you this sentence. But if you got caught with powder cocaine in the same amount, your mandatory minimum was probation. So what this means is same drug into law is written a very disparate, a very different um, penalty. And the reason this adds up 
to be um, institutional discrimination and racism is that crack cocaine was used more by people who were black and Latino or Hispanic, and powder cocaine was used more by wealthier white individuals and Hispanics. So what you have as a result of this is more a very disproportionate rate of people incarcerated who are black or Hispanic compared to white. What this means is there's a disparate, if, if African Americans are 12 to 13 percent of our population, they're more like 60 percent of the population of those in prison. That's the disparity here. And it's institutional, not individual, because even if the judge did not think this was an appropriate punishment, when especially in comparison to this just being based on different kinds of cocaine, um, the judge had to use this sentencing guideline. Okay, So you can see the disparities by race I've pulled here, and you can see the average sentencing differences here in this graph. Um, but essentially what this adds up to is a skyrocketing rate of people incarcerated and people incarcerated for drugs. And a very, very disproportionate number of those people are people of color. Okay, It has gone down just slightly since then. There's a more updated um, chart in your textbook that you can check out. Hopefully this made sense because I want to kind of um, pause here and then go into the theories. But based, what I want you to take away from this is this is an example of if you decide as a society that you're going to treat drug use as a crime versus a public health issue, and you put into place whether they're intentional or not, racist, uh, institutionally discriminatory laws, you get this level of incarceration and you get very disproportionate numbers of people who are non-white in prison for drug crime. Ironically, this there are people now still serving time for marijuana when it is legal in many states. So there's another aspect to this, and that was the three strikes and you're outlaw, where if you had committed, you know, three felonies and you're out, it, it seems like that's rational, right? Because you would assume that person would be knowingly committing felonies, but it turns out that it's much easier to commit a felony once you already have a record than you might think. So you've got people who maybe were busted for some amount of drugs, maybe um, went to prison, were released, and then violated parole, parole or probation, and that would be a second felony offense. And then maybe they end up getting, um, you know, arrested for having a handgun when they're not supposed to. That person in the 80s and 90s is going to prison for life now, even though I know it's it's illegal, but even though it's not what we would think of as someone committing three separate um, violent crime sprees or murders. Okay, so I'm going to pause here and then finish up with uh, another lecture on theory. Thanks.